Hey guys, it's Ingrid here. Welcome to another Folio webinar. Today, I have the honor of hosting Noam Hazan. Noam is an architect who studied and trained in the UK and who has worked for critically acclaimed architecture practices in London, New York, and Toronto. In 2014, Noam established Noam Hazan Design Studio, a boutique design firm focusing on architecture and interiors. He also co-founded North Space, the first co-working company in North York, Toronto. Today, he is the creative director of SDI Design and an investor. So in case you're not familiar with me, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ingrid Velasquez, and I am the chief of content and marketing for Folio. Folio is a product specification and data management software for the design and build industry. Our software streamlines the creation of product schedules, purchasing, invoicing, creating documents, and more. If you would like to know more, please go to folio.com. That's F-O-H-L-I-O.com. We would be happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one demo with you. So back to today's webinar. Today, we will be learning about the modern workspace and how it impacts design. Specifically, Noam will be talking about how co-working and working from home are impacting office spaces, um, activity-based work, and the ability or inability to focus, and um, examples of new spaces with offices. Um, Plus, there's also going to be a brief history lesson um, on the workplace uh, from where the concept of the office began, its evolution from clerks through to phone centers and the tech boom. And as usual, before I hand the presentation over, please remember that you can type in your question in the little question box on your screen, and we will have answers for you after the question. And with that, Hello, Noam. Thank you for being with us. Hello, today. hello. Thank you very much for uh, hosting. <laughs> oh, so, uh, by the way, um, congratulations on the Raptors win. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was a great day. <laughs> I got no work done yesterday because uh, the streets were insane. Uh, oh, if you, oh, really? If you saw our Instagram page. It's uh, like you couldn't see even the street. There were so many people outside. There was apparently 1.5 to 2 million people in downtown Toronto yesterday celebrating the. Uh, the parade. It was crazy. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for hosting. Um, the, the, you, you gave a little intro to the talk. It's slightly changed um, to the originally spoke, but it's still based on um, on the new workspace of today, the workplace of today, and um, and the issue of you know the closed office versus the open office. So uh, with that, you know, I'll just give a quick introduction to SDI as well. Um, so SDI Design is a Toronto-based design firm, and uh, we focus mostly in workplace design. The, the company's been around for just over 30 years, or just around 30 years, um, and there's, we've estimated that SDI has designed about 15 million square feet of office space uh, in and around Canada. So, um, you know, with all that knowledge, we sort of gather that knowledge and we, we often like to, to put out um, our latest findings. We're right now doing a white paper based on all the projects we've done in the last 10 years to extract the data and findings from those projects that we can now learn and help design better spaces of the future. Um, so with that, we'll talk about the open versus the closed office. So I'll just play a little video and I just want to make sure you can all see the screen. Can you see the YouTube video right now? Good? Yes. Yes, okay, great. I'm going to play a little video. So, as you can see, the, uh, the open office has its challenges. And, um, you know, there, is be, there has been this huge debate online 
anyone who's kind of following workplace trends right now will know there's a debate on the open office versus the closed office, and I'm sure they'll have their own opinion on the matter. Um, but, you know, in recent years, articles have come out attacking the open office and, and the closed, and, and kind of, talk, you know, talking, picking up the, the open office, vice versa. Um, and here's a great example. So Inc. Uh, magazine, which uh, is a great website if you, if you don't know it, uh, came out with this article, New Harvard Study, Your Open Plan Office is Making Your Team Less Collaborative. Now, the same month, and this was in June, um, June of last year, this article came out. Open offices are amazing. Here's why the naysayers are 100% wrong. So, obviously, two, these two people really disagree with each other, but ironically, they're writing for the same magazine. And then this, mag this article comes out. It's official. Open plan offices are now the dumbest management fad of all time. So, three, ar three articles, two of them contradicting the other, um, and people advocating for the open office versus the closed office. And it goes even further, and like, even like scientific research is in conflict. Is it the open office is better? Is the, is the closed office better? Um, and then this this uh, this study took place and it was it was published in the Occupational and Environmental Medicine Journal about uh, about workplaces. And this was sort of part of their conclusion. This this uh, quote: "So workers in open offices are less stressed and more active than cubicle workers, perhaps because they move around more to interact with colleagues." Um, another paper came out by Harvard researchers suggesting people who work in open offices are less likely than, cub uh, than cubicles where they to collaborate or interact with their colleagues. So two studies, scientific research studies came out and they're both, the conclusion is conflicting with each other. So it poses the question like why, why are people debating the open office versus the closed office? People, everything's, you know, every, people have different experiences. I, I imagine that the those two papers were, you know, a lot more research based. But the articles that I showed earlier, I imagine had a lot to do with the influence of the office space that those people had worked in. And, and I think people are focusing on the wrong question. Uh, it's not about the open office necessarily versus the closed office. So according to like environmental psychology, it's, it's, it's really about the two states that you have in the office, the happy and creative state versus the stress state. And then the question is, you know, is it what type of office creates these environments for different people? Um, so I think by rephrasing the debate, we can actually create better offices. It's no longer about the uh, the open office versus the closed office, and we'll go into that a little bit deeper. So unhappy workers, uh, stressed out workers, are you know creating huge losses to companies. Uh, they are the biggest expense for a company is the biggest expense and you know having an unhappy worker in a in an office that is not conducive to creativity and happiness can cause a detrimental amount of um, you know an economic loss to a company uh, this there's an estimate that 450 to 550 billion dollars is lost uh, to the US economy due to unproductivity by workers um, basically because they are stressed out and they're not engaged at work. The cost to replace uh, a high-level executive who isn't, isn't uh, engaged and is stressed and, and is not performing can cost 200% of that person's salary. And there's a study that estimates that 15 days is the amount of sick days a person who is unhappy at work will take uh, in a single year, which is a, which is a, a lot more that, you know, companies usually give, in, especially in North America, 10 to 15 days uh, work that's almost double the amount of vacation days if you kind of see it as vacation almost. So what we've done is we have identified three factors that really affect the happiness or the stress of employees in the workplace. So going through this like hierarchical pyramid, uh, environment is the most important. So we'll go we'll go through each one individually. Um, your emotional being, uh, your wellness in the space is the second most important, and then flexibility. And they all, they're all important, but you know, without one, you can't have the next sort of thing. So let's jump straight into it. So environment. Um, these three elements you know, often are overlooked, um, you know, especially when companies are just updating or upgrading their space. Uh, and, and it's really these three elements that really need to be considered when, uh, when companies look for new space. 
So, you know, sound is a huge issue. Um, and I think, that, you know, one of the big issues of the open office is sound. And, you know, a lot of designers in the last 10, 15 years have been specifying uh, concrete flooring and hard surfaces in the office and haven't really taken into account, especially these open offices, taken into account how fast and how quick sound travels. Um, and you're trying to focus at work and you, you can hear the person next to you on the phone or, um, you know, there's muffled sounds in the, no in, in the office. It, it's hard to concentrate. Um, so sound is really important. Uh, air is another important factor. It's not just air, but also temperature. And different, uh, you know, different levels of temperature result in different amounts of productivity from workers. So when you're really hot, you're much more or less productive than when, you, when it's a cool temperature. I know that men and women have different temperature thresholds of where they are better at uh, performing. Uh, and also your body weight is a big factor. So, you know, it's, it's not always easy for designers to be able to accommodate all those elements. But if you have a variety of spaces with an office, there may, then, or, or at least personal control on your own temperature, um, it can definitely uh, help with that uh, experience. And then daylight. Uh, daylight is really important as well. Um, there's a study that shows people who don't get daylight or get enough daylight um, during the day have a lot more trouble sleeping at night and don't have as good quality sleep in, at night. And obviously that affects the way that people are the next day when you're tired and you, you haven't been recharged. Um, so that's environment. These are the kind of three basic elements, the basic needs that people need to function in a workplace. Uh, and then we go to the emotional needs. And I would say probably sound and privacy uh, are the two biggest factors that have come out or the two biggest challenges that have been created by the open office. Um, so privacy, like one, one thing we hear all the time is when we're designing office space that people don't want to have their backs facing to a hallway where people can see what they're working on. Um, it's uncomfortable when, you know, you can't just, you know, if you need to take a few minutes break and you want to browse your Facebook or you want to go on your Instagram, or I guess you're not using Instagram on your computer, but let's say your Facebook or whatever, uh, it's uncomfortable because people are, can see what you're working on all the time so you really don't have any privacy and and privacy is a big factor for your uh if your uh, office wellness um interaction now again different studies have come out as we saw from those research papers uh interacting with colleagues in some cases you're doing it more in the open office in some cases you're doing it less but i think i feel like technology is also a big factor on how people are interacting so you know uh, applications like whatsapp and slack are really affecting um, the way people are interact. People often jump to Slack before actually getting out their desk and walking across the office to, uh, to interact with a colleague. Um, and actually, there's a big loneliness epidemic happening uh, around the world, but predominantly in Europe right now, where technology is, is, is taking over you know, a bigger way in some areas. And uh, there's studies to show that people don't really have any friends in the office anymore. It's not, not as much as they used to. I remember... Um, when I had my first job in the UK as an architect, there were people who would socialize with each other on the weekends and in the evenings, but would also work together on a daily basis. And, I, and, and studies are showing that that's not happening as much anymore. Uh, and people don't feel as close to their colleagues as they used to. Uh, so that's the second element of emotional needs. And then safety. So there's the element of like the circle of safety that Simon Sinek talks about in his TED Talks. Um, that's not. That's more about the management, uh, I guess, strategies. Where the design element comes in is creating safe spaces for people to leave their their objects. Um, you know, if the the building is, um, you know, if someone's working late at night and they go down to the lobby and it's dark and it's dingy, that doesn't feel like a safe space where someone's going to be comfortable leaving the office after you know six seven o'clock. So designing with those elements in mind or somewhere personal to leave your stuff overnight where you feel you can safely leave your belongings in the office uh, and not get stolen. Um, something like that is important, again, to add, to add to that factor of whether you're too stressed or you're happy at work. So all those help. And finally, flexibility. And uh, when we talk about flexibility, we talk about a couple of things. One is the ability to, uh, to work from home and the ability to sort of, you know, not have to necessarily work nine to five, but you, you get your hours in if you start, you know, start working at 10, but finish at six or seven, 
that is another element of flexibility. As long as you get your work done, your hours are flexible. So a lot of companies are starting to take this on. Uh, how, is this, how do we relate this to interior design? Um, and that, become, that comes in more about offering a variety of spaces within the workplace where people have the flexibility to, to work in. So let me give an example. Um, right now, and you'll see an image of it later on in the presentation, I'm currently sitting in a conferencing room in our office, away from everywhere else. So I, so I have the option to not disturb everyone. I can work in here, focus. I have the flexibility to use this space, as an example. Or we have, um, you know, basically a, a variety of spaces, and I'll get to the next slide. And then the autonomy to be able to uh, get up from your desk and walk around and use those different spaces within the space. You know, people work differently. There are different personalities um, within an office space, different generations as well. So, you know, we have, uh, I'd say, four generations in our workplace, maybe even five, actually, um, all the way from Gen Z to the baby boomers. And everyone works quite differently. Uh, and, you know, they may be using the same spaces, but they might be using the same, the same spaces for different reasons. There's a guy in our office who who every single task he does, he does it, he's just all over, the, all over the office because he finds those different parts of the office are more conducive to what he's working on. So some of these examples uh, are on this page and these are different activities. So based on like the principles of activity-based work, um, depending on the task that you're doing at the time, um, may, you know, you want to have a space that is conducive for those different tasks. Like if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone, it's not ideal to have it at your desk where you're going to be disturbing everyone around you and you're not going to be able to focus on it. Um, so, uh, you know, as an example, as I just mentioned, the conferencing room that I'm in now, uh, an individual-focused area is, could also be used, the room that I'm in now could also be used for that, which is a closed door. Uh, and there's no one around to disturb. I can really get down and focus on what I'm doing. Um, something like recharging, Having an area of the of the of the office where you can go, recharge, socialize, do non-related work activities, and then go back to work with a fresh mind. So these are just some examples, and I'll show how it's been applied in a couple of projects um, in our case study. So I'm going to take you through three projects that we've done, um, and just give you a little tour of those projects and show you how some of these principles of these three elements have been applied. So this project is a, a UK insurance company called Beasley. And uh, based in, this is their uh, Toronto-based office. And what we did was we, um, we convinced the client to go with unassigned seating. So none of the employees in the office have, have their own desk. But within the office, they have um, many different environments that they can work in that's conducive to what the activities that they're working on, all the different types of people and personalities that, that are in this, in this company. Um, can you guys uh, see my mouse moving right now? Just wondering uh, if Ingrid yes. can see it. Yep. Okay, great. So I'm gonna use the mouse just to explain the different areas. So uh, let's start with the blue. So the blue area in this diagram, in this plan is a focused area. Um, and that is like a quiet space. Uh, it's actually no talking, like the companies impose a no talking policy within that area where people can go and focus, have their own personal desks. But again, they're not, they're not, um, they're not assigned, so they can be used and booked um, when, you're, when you need somewhere to go in and focus. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it on here, but there are different, even within that space, there are different types of furniture that, and different types of environments that cater for the different personalities and the different focused tasks that you might need. And we'll get, I'll get you to some images of that uh, shortly as well. Um, then we have the purple, which is like an individual processing area. So what that means is you're still working alone, but you don't mind having like brief interrupt, uh, interruptions um, while you're working. So someone you know, might ask you a quick question, or you might shout over to a colleague who's sitting across from you and have a, a brief chat. Uh, but th that's very different to having focused, where you, you know that you're, if you're in there, you're not, gonna, not to be disturbed. Um, and then we have a phone booth, which is for those private conversations with your mother that you don't want to talk about in front of all your colleagues, um, or, or with, you know, a confidential conversation with a client. Um, and then we've got dialogue spaces, which is the yellow. You can kind of see them here, which are more like breakout spaces, but still within that, um, you know, areas that it's acceptable to speak in. 
the socializing, relaxing area. So we have like a large cafe uh, that you can have meetings in, presentations, but also is used just to kind of go and, and relax and recharge. And then of course, like private meeting rooms to coordinate and to present and to work in those meetings. So this is the project. I'm gonna do a little walkthrough. Um, so this is our, the reception. You just enter into the, uh, into the space easily and straight away you have these break, breakout areas. So for example, if you have a client who's just coming to say hello or drop something off, you don't necessarily have to take them through the entire space in the meeting room. You can have a really casual chat just here in the sort of reception lobby area. Uh, if you want to sort of get away and work kind of in that cafe feel, you can, you can come out and work in that space. Um, and then we take you through to the, uh, the lunchroom. So again, like it's multi-purpose, it's used as a lunchroom. You can have lunch here with your colleagues, but you can also come in the back. We've created these more like private booths where you can have lunch, but also have a meeting or grab your coffee, have a meeting. So creating that variety of space, you're not necessarily in a stuffy office all the time, but you can come out and be in like a more casual setting. Um, in the same space, we actually added a huge screen uh, this is to allow, so basically have a bunch of offices around the world. This is to allow the colleagues in one space to interact with colleagues in the other space, as well as do presentations and actually utilize this, you know, create flexibility within the space so that, um, you know, meeting rooms are not necessarily the main area that you have to have a presentation. You can also do it casually or do a town hall in here, things like that. Walk you through into the... Um, the corridor. So here we see like we've, we've allowed for lockers. Actually this space is built. We haven't photographed it yet, but um, it kind of looks, it looks almost exactly like the render. Um, so you see the lockers on the right here. We have personal lockers for employees because they're unassigned seating. Um, we've given options for people to have somewhere to store their belongings. Uh, this little breakout space here is maybe for like a more of a private chat away from everywhere else. You know, there might be an HR meeting or something. Um, and you can even go in one of these offices. And in the worst case scenario, if someone's, you know, being laid off or being fired, they don't have to do the walk of shame through the entire office. It's literally right by the front door. So that was strategically placed there. Um, this black door over here is a wellness room where we have um, sort of like, a, you kind of see it as like a pumping station if there are, uh, new mothers that are still pumping breast, breast milk for their children. There's an area to store the milk. There's a fridge in there. Uh, if you need to go and relax in there, you can. So those things are sort of being catered for um, within the office space. Now we go to uh, the processing area where you can do work, personal work, but you don't mind getting disturbed. Um, we'll keep going through there because it's quite a large space. So within here, we even have processing but open where you can go into these more enclosed semi-private areas um, the ceiling is a sound attenuation um, paneling to to make sure there's not as much of an echo in that space and we've carpeted the floors uh, again for sound purposes we'll go into this other space over here a few more of those processing stations but also breakout stations for teams to have to, to be able to work uh, on a presentation or on something on some work together uh, we've done the higher tables so that um, you can stand don't have to sit all the time if you want to just go and work at one of these tables you can um, and then that area behind where you see the kind of the wooden sort of sculpt like the, the wooden element the wooden structure um, that is that quiet focused area so completely sealed off there's there's doors to go in we'll go straight in uh, in fact, you can kind of see the phone booth over, let's see if I can navigate this, here we go. Um, so we've done the uh, traditional Doctor Who um, phone booth, paying homage to the British uh, origins of this company. And walking through that phone booth, so that phone booth would be for those personal private calls, uh, we go straight into the quiet focused area. So in the space, um, we've used a lot of softer materials to absorb the, to absorb the, uh, the sound, but also really private kind of focused areas where you know that if you're in there, you're not going to get disturbed. You have these, these benches behind, uh, so can turn around. Um, here you have sort of more private personal stations 
where if you really want to get away from everyone, you don't want people to see what you're doing, you can go in there. Uh, this is sort of more of a casual workstation, but still private. And then if you really want to like have a call or be in real privacy, have that visual privacy and sound privacy, you can go into one of these, these meeting rooms over here. Um, so that's pro pretty much the overall. We also have like a boardroom here where you have those meetings um, with larger groups. You can present, uh, give talks, and again, also do video conferencing with, with teams abroad. Um, so that's Beasley. Um, and it's sort of demonstrating these different varieties within the space, different varieties of space. Um, and we're going to jump into Novo Nordisk. So Novo Nordisk is a, um, it's a company, a, a Scandinavian company uh, based out of Denmark that have a headquarters in Canada. Uh, Novo um, basically approached us and said, you know, their last office was not conducive to bringing clients to. Um, they, they found that there were a lot of silos within the space. Different departments were not talking to each other. So what we did was, there's two floors. The ground floor was client-facing floors with meeting rooms and breakout spaces, cafes. Um, so they could host their events and have people there. It was much more welcoming. And I'll show, in fact, let's just jump to that. So this is their ground floor, part of their ground floor with a large cafe. So the staff come down here every day and they have lunch here and the, the company provides them with uh, hot food every day. Um, but this is also an area where they can work and be casual and interact. And it, it creates the opportunity for a lot more interactions with colleagues. In fact, I think they have a policy that they're not allowed to eat at their desks. So every time they want to eat, they'll have to come down. And every time they come down, there might be other people down there or during lunchtime when the food is served, they get to interact with other colleagues to kind of counter that, um, uh, that, that sort of loneliness epidemic that's happening. Um, going back to this slide, so the, the first image on the left there are these sort of little breakout spaces that sit just outside of the workstation. So we've created like clusters of workstations uh, with different teams. And, but within that area, we've created a lot of different breakout spaces. You know, for example, the yellow chairs there are, right, are situated right next to the, um, sorry, the yellow benches sitting right next to the workstations. This little, um, these two chairs just outside this meeting room is an area where, you know, let's say you're about to have a meeting. You know, often you get people lining up, waiting outside. We've all been there where we've waited for a meeting and someone's still in there. This is, gives it creates the opportunity for you to have, like, just to talk to your colleagues in a more relaxed manner. You can sit down and wait comfortably before having to go to a meeting. And then uh, at the bottom right on this image is an area where clients can be taken to. It's right by the entrance. It's more of an open discussion, more casual. So again, providing a lot of different varieties of space for the employees to engage, interact, and, and that are diff and conducive to different, um, different tasks within the workplace. And then finally, this is our office, and these are some extractions from our uh, Instagram. Um, so the first, the first two images are actually identical. And you can see that the same space can be used for two different purposes. So this is the, the guy I was telling you about earlier, Sam, who is found all over the office every day. And, um, and here you can see him. He's either individually processing, so maybe he's on the Folio app and he's looking at different specifications uh, and he's just going through and checking you know, everything he specified is in there. Or maybe he's relaxing and he's browsing on Facebook or he's texting his girlfriend or something. So same, same furniture. Same, you know, solution, but has two purposes. Um, the third image on there, the, you know, the focus area, that's actually the room I'm in right now on the left. Um, so, you know, we've created more private areas to have a call, to work, to focus, if we want to get step away from our desk and actually do some, some meaningful deep work. Um, and then dual processing. So, uh, again, having an area you can kind of step away from your desk, you're not disturbing every, anyone, and you can actually work on a task together with another member of the team. Um, okay, what else we've got? Informing. And I, I just realized that title was incorrect. Um, so ignore that. Uh, informing. So within our studio. So our studio is actually an interesting space. We have around 3,500, about 3,200 square feet, I would say. And about 2,000 of the, that square footage, two-thirds, is um, flexible and communal space. And the one third is where we have the desks. In that third image where you see the process, we have workstations. But everywhere else is flexible space. And we have this huge cafe uh, that can be turned into a cafe, but it's also 
It can be divided up into bleachers and you know, someone can give a presentation or it can be cleared entirely for an event. So really having that opportunity to have flexible space is really key. And I, I feel like a lot of companies now are moving away from that and giving less square footage to individual um, employees for their workstation and giving them more variety and more options to go and to work with um, within their space. So here are just a couple more examples of different activities that are happening within our studio. And I think it really goes back to that, that point, you know, where I started where it's not necessarily about, it's not about the, the open concept versus the clo closed concept. It's really about the human factor. So these elements, the, the real estate, the finance, the functional requirements of your space are critical, but it should be driven by that user, user experience, the human factor. And, um, and that's why, you know, SDI, our, our slogan or, the, you know, our ideology is made for humans. We really focus on that human experience. Um, and that's, uh, that's how we design it. I think, and, you know, that's the most important element for us um, so that you get happy workers and not the stressed workers. And we do everything we can in our design to provide those environments and make sure that, um, you know, that workers that we design for are ultimately happy and, and the, 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 the organizations and the clients that we work for ultimately benefit from that. So that's, uh, that's everything. Um, hopefully that gave an overview of the most recent trends. Um, you know, just to add on that, actually, I got back from Neocon, uh, which is that, which in Chicago, which is the, um, the commercial real estate uh, furniture convention that I think the largest in North America. And a lot of the um, items we saw were related to privacy and sound. So visual privacy and uh, audio privacy. And a lot of the products that are coming into the market are responding to that. And that's a huge factor. So uh, it was very interesting to, to see actually. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the presentation. If any of you have any questions. Feel free to uh, ask away. Yeah, um, if you guys have any questions, please type them in. Now is the time. Um, thank you, Noam. This has been amazing. Um, and speaking as someone who is not a designer or, you know, anywhere near that, this made so much sense to me. So, amazing. Great. Uh, and it was uh, valuable. Thank you. Um, actually, I will... Um, I'll go ahead and ask the first question. Uh, this, um, this webinar today is actually really good timing. Um, so my husband's company had just gotten um, bought out by, you know, by, a di by different people. Um, and one of the changes that they are bringing is that instead of the traditional, um, uh, the traditional model where people have their own desks that they go to every day and some people have offices, um, they're going to do hot desking. And this is very distressing for a lot of his coworkers, not to mention him as well. And this morning, they actually, um, so, uh, he was actually at um, the office of the architect who is working on their new office, which is going to be ready late next year. Um, so him and a few other representatives of different departments. Um, and one of the, some of the things that he had concerns about was that um, a lot of, he and a lot of his colleagues have, um, like this feeling of having a home base where they sit every day, they have a routine, they can display their pictures and um, not just being comfortable in that way, but also um, it, it kind of feels to them like hot desking kind of makes them feel like they're dispensable. Yeah. It's like not so personal, not so homey anymore. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, that's a very big thing to them because before they got bought out, um, it was actually a family business and their whole culture was this whole, we're, we're a big family and we're taking care of everyone and all of that. And there are other issues as well. Like um, they have a, they have a print magazine 
side of their company where people have their stacks of prints that they refer to every day. And then he is also working with this guy that um, he's on a spectrum and he needs his routines. Right. And he can't be hot desking every day. Everything is something different. So um, if you were that architect that they spoke with today, what would have, what would have been your solutions to those? So, yeah, so, I mean, this is something we hear a lot of the time. I don't know how big that your husband's company is, but a lot of companies now, like, so there's two things that companies do. And, like, one, you know, Deloitte is a, a good example. Their Toronto office, um, I would estimate there's over a 1,000 people who work there. I don't know for sure, but there's, you know, it's like six floors, massive floor plate, and there's not, there's no assigned desks. People work anywhere. I mean, they act, a friend of mine who works there told me that people fight over the same desks. So, you know, there are challenges that are coming out of the unassigned seating model. Um, but, you know, it works. It works. The really interesting thing about unassigned seating model is it kind of breaks down some of those bar barriers and boundaries. You might some one day find yourself sitting next to the CEO of the whole company and having a nice chat with that person. You might never get an opportunity to meet. So there are, you know, or like clash with, not necessarily clash, sorry, I would say collide with um, a member in another department and come up with some, like, you know, to tell them what you're working about. They'll tell you what they're working on. And then there might be another project that comes out of that. So, you know, there are some really interesting things happening about the unassigned seating. But one of the complaints, as you rightly mentioned, is that there's it kind of, you lose that personalization feel where you haven't got your own desk anymore. Um, and it's not, really it doesn't really feel like home as much anymore so i think what companies are now doing is creating neighborhoods within within the building or within the organization so that let's say i don't know the sales team have one neighborhood so it's unassigned seating but within that neighborhood they can sit wherever they want and they might have a wall in that neighborhood where they could put up their photos like a sort of communal wall mm -hmm. and often we'll find actually that you know depending on the size of the organ of the building like Deloitte is an example where they have more employees than they have seats. So if everyone is, you can't have a situation where everyone's in the office. Um, but let's say, let's just say in your situation that, you know, there, there was the same amount of seats as there were employees. You often find that people do end up just sitting in the same desk every day. Yeah. Even though it's not a sign. So, you know, I, I think, you know, there's that. And there's also a level of, of sort of client management and change management. Um, there are obviously a lot of benefits for the organization of moving to unassigned seating. One is that you free up a lot more space to have those variety of spaces within the place. So, you know, if you have, everyone has a desk, you take up more real estate and you don't have the opportunity to have as, as many um, different environments within your workplace. So, so, you know, that's obviously one of the benefits in moving to unassigned seating. Uh, it also means that you can have, um, like Deloitte have done, have more staff than desks. So, because not everyone works from the office every day, a lot of people work from home or work remotely. You know, some salespeople are only in two days a week. So, why would you, mm -hmm. you know, get the get the pay for the real estate for those two people that are going to be here, you know, in the office two days a week or two days a month? You know, yeah. So it makes a lot of sense. I would say to your husband, um, you know, one conversation he might want to bring up with the architect is that idea of neighbourhoods. Um, and that sort of builds, helps build the teams and helps kind of build those, I'd say, yeah, I guess teams within the organization gives them a bit more of a home within the floor play. Yep. Awesome. Um, oh, so yeah, um, I did ask him that before, um, while, while you were doing your lecture and I was asking him, um, did you bring up that? those all those um uh issues that you had and he responded just now saying that um they're likely to operate in zones so their website will um so their dot com section will have a zone accounting it's gonna have is gonna have its own zone so it's like you said it's they're gonna have their neighborhoods and yeah probably like um those common areas that you were just talking about yeah yeah cool awesome, so awesome. The right track <laughs> yeah <laughs> um all right uh so any other questions from our 
audience today? Where's everyone uh, calling in from? Just curious to know. Um, we definitely have someone from New York. Oh, nice. We have someone all the way from the Philippines. So it's 1.44 in the morning for them. Okay, <laughs> dedicated to... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh, here we go. Hui Bin has a question. Uh, sure. Hui, Hui Bin, if you unmute, you can you can actually talk. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, this is from Portfolio. Um, so Noam, thank you so much for the, the webinar. Um, um, so so far, like you know, especially after you uh, come back from Neocon, do you see any trends from manufacturers to make the product more flexible to be configured into different spaces? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. Um, so I actually wrote an article recently, if you check out SDI's uh, LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn page um, about the recent trends, but one of the main trends that has come out of, of Neocon, I think I would say as a result of rather than audio privacy, more visual privacy um, and flexibility is using drapery. So a lot of companies now are introducing drapery lines to their uh, portfolios, to their, um, you know, to their product lists. And they're creating systems where, like a company it's called Buzzy Space out of, I think they're out of um, Belgium, I believe. They, uh, they've created this like frame system where instead of having like screen, traditional screens, uh, you know what, maybe I'll just, I'll open it up so I can actually talk to it. Um, Basically, they've created these screens where uh, it's, it's created by drapery. Here, here's, here's, the, here's the image. Um, and, you know, there's different types of drapery. So the really thick sound absorbing ones that can actually give you the option to, to have a little bit of a private conversation, more, you know, somewhat private. And then the really kind of transparent, almost see-through thin um, drapery that just creates that visual privacy, makes you feel like you're... Uh, more secluded from the rest of the team. So I'd say that was probably one of the biggest things that came out of Neocon. Um, the felt material that everyone's using, which is like this material made from um, recyclable uh, plastic, recycled plastic bottles, water bottles, um, and converted into this sound absorbing felt material. And there was a cool company called Devon out of Holland, I believe. Um, who have started creating furniture out of that material as well, furniture, wall panels. Um, so it's really interesting because these are really sound, sound absorbing, proper, you know, um, sound absorbing furniture elements. Uh, and they've even gone as far as doing them in light shades and in, you know, wall uh, ceiling hung um, slats almost to kind of add to that extra level of um, sound absorbent material. And then finally, the, the you know. The rise of the phone booth. The phone booths are going crazy. So many companies doing phone booths now. Um, I'd say those are the three main ones. I've done ten. I'll let you read that. I don't want to take up too much time going through all of them. But um, the, the three main. I'd say the three main elements, all kind of related to privacy, visual privacy, and audio privacy, are those the three elements I just spoke about. But yeah. Very cool. I still like your um, Doctor Who phone booth the best. Uh, it's really great. <laughs> yeah, they, they quite love that. It was like a, a little hint of UK in their, uh, in their Toronto-based office. All right, yeah. any other questions, you guys? Um, one more question for me. So how does this, um, like, you know, design trends, and like more open space, um, impact the designers in your company, how they organize their um, product information and how they specify and research products? Um, so yeah, I mean, the trends of the office space, the workplace is changing all the time, um, partly because of a reaction to, you know, other previous trends. So I'll give an example, um, you know, offices used to be open, 
you know, back in, I'd say, what was it the fifties maybe? And then they realized, okay, there's too, you can hear too much. It's too disturbing. They created all these cubicles, which then turned into like cubicles and then executive offices. So trends, are, and then now they're kind of realizing the open office doesn't really work anymore. We need more variety. We need open office areas. We need closed office areas. So trends are changing all the time. Uh, I mean, Neocon is a great place. Uh, these kind of conventions to go and see what people are working on. Um, you know, all these companies have research, the big companies have research departments and they're studying and they're doing workplace studies. So they are driving out some of the la latest trends. Um, how we, we, so what we do actually typically after Neocon, we get like lunch and learns and meetings with a lot of the companies and vendors that we work with and they come and present for anyone that couldn't make it because um, we can't send the whole company to Chicago every year. Um, anyone who couldn't make it, they'll come and present their latest lines and latest products. And then we'll, they'll, we'll, you know, often they'll send us some of their furniture to test out for a couple of weeks in the office, things like that. We get these like uh, these demo prototypes that they, uh, they install for us in our office, create, and then we can test them out, learn about them and then, um, and then specify them add them to our spec list <laughs> oh thank you you're welcome uh, great any other questions i'll just give people a few more minutes and maybe i'll have something but while we're waiting um guys i just want to remind everyone that um this web uh this webinar is going to be available as a recording on YouTube and we will be sharing the link with everyone once it's published and it's also going to be turned into a podcast mm -hmm. uh, the link to which we will also be sharing with everyone so you know you can go over Noam's uh, points today at your own pace which you should. There, there have been some really, really good um, lessons here today. Thank you. Thank you. I feel this like you great. need to have a specific voice for a podcast. You know what I mean? You need to have that like soft spoken. <laughs> I always, uh, every time I listen to a podcast, I was like, that guy has an amazing, or that girl has an amazing podcast voice. You know. Anyway, I'll hear myself and then I'll make that judgment. <laughs> Well, you have a very relaxing voice, so right. that that would help. Okay. All right, I course, think hopefully that was uh, that was valuable. Um, anyone who's designing workspace, hopefully you've got some tips now. And uh, yeah, if you want to reach out, you know, feel free to get my details or connect me on connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to uh, give some advice. Very good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Noam. Thanks for so much. Your time today. This has been very, very educational. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.